My name is Teresa Ludvigson. I'm, a, I'm from Alberni Valley Hospice Society. And we're at our location at 2579 10th Avenue. And we want to tell you about our new event, Light Up Hospice, which will begin December 1st for the whole month. So we've never had this event before, and this is our answer to the COVID pandemic social distancing requirements. So we will have this every year and you can come by and enjoy the scenery or you can participate uh, through purchasing uh, lights or decor in memory of a loved one that you've lost in the past. And uh, we'll make it happen. So we do know that this is, you know, a tough time of year for some people. So we hope to bring some cheer and some light to everybody's life. and. Please give us a call at 723-4478 if you'd like to get lights or decor uh, for our light up event. Hi there, my name is Carly Gittleman and I am the local food distribution coordinator for the Food RX Food Box program offered by Island Health and the Alberni Transition Town Society. The Food Box program is a weekly food box which is delivered to patients who are released from the West Coast General Hospital. There's a screening process which deems which patients may be food insecure and would benefit from our program. The food box contains foods that are harvested, processed, and grown in the Alberni Valley. There's dairy products, grain products, vegetables, meats, uh, eggs, and as well as coupons and recipes. Our local producers who are contributing to the food box each week are Shelter Farm, who contribute vegetables, Coleman Meadow Farm, which contributes cheeses and yogurt, the Hupachasat Community Farm contributes garlic, the Nighthawk Ridge Farm contributes beef. Vancouver Island Grain and Milling contributes grain products like cereal, pancake mix, and flour. Hertel Meats contribute pork like so sausages and bacon. St. Jean's contributes candied salmon, canned tuna, canned salmon, butter clams, and clam chowder to our box. Mountain View Bakery contributes bread and muffins. We also get eggs and in each box there are coupons from the farmer's market, there's gift cards to quality foods, and we also put recipes in each box. The box is perfect for people who are being released from the hospital who maybe don't feel like cooking so much or not able to go do their own grocery shopping. This is a pilot program which is running till the 1st of December. Patients who participate receive food boxes for four weeks. In the coming weeks, I'll be introducing you to some of our producers who are contributing to the box. In the meantime, I'll be delivering healthy foods to your neighbors and members of the community who may need some extra support. Hi, I'm Carly Gittleman from the Food Prescription Box program here in Port Alberni. We're delivering fresh local foods to people released from the hospital who may need some extra support. I'm very excited to introduce you to some of the local producers whose food I'm delivering in the boxes each week. I'm here at Nighthawk Ridge Farm and I'm going to be speaking with Kathy. She supplies grass-fed beef to our food box every week. Our place is called Nighthawk Ridge Farms. My family bought it in uh, 1974 and uh, we've always had beef cattle here. We raised our family here and uh, meat became important, the good clean meat. And so we raised our family on the meat and then we became better at marketing it <laughs> and, uh, and, and got more cows. So we have um, about 21 girls here right now, cows who will be bred in the next month and they'll uh, produce calves next summer and w some of the calves will sell as feeders and some of the calves will keep and and grow them up and market them here in the valley we're just in the process of uh, getting our D license so that we can slaughter on site here and use local 
resources to um, uh, cut and wrap and freeze our products. So the cows are on the grass through the summer months, the spring and the summer months, and then come this time of year, they're up close to the barn. We've got feeders here, both sides of the barn where um, one side for the calves and the other side for the, for the, for the cows. Um, they're not panned up. They're, they've got access to approximately 40 acres of, half of it is, is cleared and half of it is forest and they, they love to be in the forest sometimes and sometimes they uh, love to be close to the barn. Anyway, they choose and uh, that keeps them moving and it um, keeps them happy. During the uh, summer, spring summer we um, harvest silage and hay off um, our fields and the we wrap everything up uh, we've got about 500 bales of silage sitting here it was a really good year for grass this year we've also got hay in another building down here that um, that is used mostly for the calves but the cows like it for a treat too they like to have a little bit of different things from time to time but anyways the so they're grass-fed we um, we try to pick a bull uh, and and cows breed uh, the right style of cow that will produce a good uh, meaty meaty well, beefy mm -hmm. uh, carcass um, without having to pump food into them or any steroids or anything and we um, so there so it's grass-fed and it's our grass it's Port Alberni grass that they're getting mm -hmm. and we've never used any chemicals here either any sprays or anything on the fields so it's pretty much just about as clean as you can get that's awesome hello Port Alberni I'm Lion George Smith the Alberni Lions Club are holding their 48th annual auction. And once again this year, it's an online only auction at our website, avlionsauction.com. We have many, many great items this year donated by local merchants, artists, and friends of lions. We have uh, gift cards for restaurants, groceries, sports, and health packages. There's even a $400 fishing trip. We have men's and ladies clothing, kitchen appliances, tools, pet supplies. There's even an NHL autographed jersey from a local player, Laurent Brissant. So go to the website at avlionsauction.com. The website's open right now to the end of the auction. So bid often, bid early, and bid high, and help support Lions Auction Program in the Alberni Valley. This auction will comply with all COVID-19 regulations. Thank you. Well, welcome back to another edition of Community Colour, bringing you arts and entertainment right here from the Alberni Valley. Cynthia Bonesky and Jan Friesen will be our next featured artists here at the Roland Art Centre. Bit of flowers to landscapes, oils to acrylics. So this exhibit runs from November 4th to the 28th. Well, the Roland Art Centre is very excited to once again have our mistletoe market take place here right at the Roland Art Centre. Now, it takes place for the entire month of December and you can stop by the Roland Art Centre and pick up your form, which is just asking for all your inventory information. And also to let you know, it's the only one on the island now that's taking, that's actually having the craft market. So it's a great opportunity for local crafters who don't necessarily come to the Roland Art Centre to, to display their artwork. So please call me at the Roland Art Centre for more details. Well, here's a great way to get a bag of books. A mystery bag of books are available right now at the Roland Art Centre. Each bag contains 10 books and there are $20. Now, it's a great deal. All bags are containing of one genre, so we have mysteries, we have biographies, we have science fiction, we have romance, children's books, you name it, we have it. So you can call us to reserve your bag or you can stop by the Roland Art Centre and pick up your bag today. Well, here's an easy way to help the Roland Art Centre and support local arts by donating your bottles at the bottle depot. Now we'll have all the information on the screen and all you need to do is drop off your bottles and say you're, you're like to donate to the Roland Art Centre and add our account and there you go. An easy way to help support local art. Well, Shars presents Zoom. Yep, everybody's going by Zoom and so is Shars Landing. So Words on 
Bonfire are now going to be presented twice a month at Shars Landing or through Zoom. Uh, the second Wednesday of each month as well as the last Wednesday of each month. So for information um, for her tickets you can contact her through the website that's available right now on the screen. Well, that's it for another edition of Community Colour. Now, if your organization would like to share any upcoming events, please contact me at the Roland Arts Centre. So until next time, I'm Melissa Martin for Community Colour. Hello, my name is Shelley. I'd just like to welcome everybody back to the 3rd Ave Recycle Depot. Uh, finally reopened after months of being off due to, as everybody knows, the COVID. So we'd just like to give you a little bit of info about what's happening, what's new, what's changed. Um, obviously, I'm still here, a few more people working out front. We are trying to be tour guides for the beginning here with new hours of operation and new system in play. Um, so let's start with the, the operation. It's Tuesday to Saturday, 9.30 to 5. We're closed Sundays and Mondays now. As you will see, we have new bins, new program, new, new setup that's new to you and new to us as well. Um, so right now we're just trying to be a tour guide, explain to you what's happening, the three different entry points, the uh, program, what we're taking. Pretty much the same as we did before, only of course we'd like you to have it pre-sorted. Um, and if you could see the smile on my face, you know I'm saying that with a smile on my face. Um, because when you start, the three different entry points are, if you have cardboard, you can just do the cardboard paper. Um, if you have more recycling, like what's in your blue bins, then you would go through the cardboard paper, carry on. We have a glass bin. We have the flexible plastic bags, of course, you know, the noisy crinklies, as I always said. And then the glass jars, clean, no lids. Uh, the plastic containers, tin cans, coffee cups, all that like. Same containers or same idea, just different containers your white styrofoam, colored styrofoam, and the soft stretchy plastic bags. And then the other entry point, or you carry on, is if you have your light bulbs, your batteries, your smoke alarms, your small appliances, computer stuff, TVs, we still take all that. And then of course the paint. The only thing we ask is if one of us is not with you and you need to go in the building with any of that, you rate for us. One of us will take you in, show you where it goes and where you can sanitize and then head out. We sanitize daily and nightly for your convenience, our pleasure, <laughs> just to keep it all clean. Um, you will see a difference here as we go through of how clean the inside is. We've already been told by some people it's really clean like a hospital, so hopefully you're not scared to come down, do your recycling, say hi. We've missed you, come on back. curator at the Alberni Valley Museum. Today on Museum at Home, we're going to look at the wedding dresses in the museum's collection. We have three wedding dresses in the collection, or rather, three that we know were worn as wedding dresses. Being able to afford a dress that was worn only once, particularly a white dress that was difficult to clean, wasn't an option for everyone, and many brides have often simply worn their best dress on their wedding day. The first dress we're looking at is a silk dress from around 1900. In 1968, before the museum was established, the dress was donated to the Museum and Historical Society by the Alexander Estate. The only note on its history was that it was the wedding dress of Mrs. D.C. Alexander. With a bit of research, we discovered that D.C. stood for Dewitt Clayton. Dewitt Clayton Alexander was born in 1875 in Wisconsin and came to Canada around 1909. His wife, Ethel Gladys Alexander, would have been born around 1883. We backtrack the number because we know she was 82 when she died in 1965. In that time period, just after 1900, women were typically married between the ages of 20 to 25, which would put the date of the dress from 1903 to 1908. Though it looks like a dress, this outfit goes on in three pieces, the bodice, the skirt, and the belt. The skirt and bodice do up at the center back with hook and eye closures, while the belt is up at the front, under the flower detail. Homemade, it is mostly machine-stitched, with some hand-stitching. 
The bodice is cut long at the front to allow for the pouch look that was popular in the early 1900s. In this 1910 wedding portrait, you can see Clarice O. Blackmore with the same pouched look. Clarice is also wearing a belt that points down at the front, as does the Alexander dress. The fabric of the Alexander dress is a very light silk that is almost transparent. In these photos, we've put a plain cotton slip on the mannequin, and the mannequin itself has been shaped to mimic the undergarments of the era. Ethel would have worn it with a corset and petticoats underneath. Silk stockings likely would have been worn with this formal outfit, and for jewelry, perhaps a brooch, a long string of pearls, or a spray of fresh flowers. In this wedding portrait from the same era, we see that the bride's dress also has a high neck and a belted waist. Our second dress is from the flapper era. The 1920s dress is slim and boyish, a marked contrast only 20 years after the Alexander dress. It was worn by Dora Osborne when she married Alf Plant on New Year's Eve in 1924. Dora was originally from Nanaimo, but came to Port Alberni in 1928, where she and her husband opened a bakery. Now you should know that we would never try on a piece from the museum's costume collection, because historic textiles can be very fragile. However, before donating this dress to the museum, the family photographed one of Dora's great-granddaughters wearing the dress. It's made of silk georgette, which drapes nicely. Together with the drop waist, it gives the dress a long, straight profile, the boyish look that was popular in the 1920s. The dress has some simple decorations of lace and long pieces of velvet ribbon on the skirt and on one shoulder. The dress is so simple, it's actually a bit difficult to tell the front from the back. As you can see in Dora's wedding photo, pictured with her mother and sisters, the dress was worn with evening gloves, long gloves that reach over the elbow, and a headpiece with a long veil. The headpiece, though not the veil, is also in the museum's collection, though it is quite delicate now, so we haven't photographed it on a mannequin. And though you can't see it in the photo, Dora's garter is also in the museum collection. This wedding portrait, from 1923, also shows the straight flapper style with the drop waist. Throughout the 20s, we see shorter dressers with the boxy look of the dropped waist, though by the 1930s, we see skirts dropping to the ankle. Our final dress is from the 1960s. Joanne Askew made her own wedding dress during the summer of 1961. Joanne studied home economics at UBC, and the museum has, in its collection, two other dresses that Joanne made during her studies at UBC in the mid-1950s. The wedding dress, or outfit, consists of two pieces, a dress with a matching jacket. The sheath dress, a popular style in the 50s and 60s, is made out of a cream-colored satin. Sleeveless, it has narrow straps at the shoulders and a lace overlay on the skirt. The bodice is lined with a satiny material, while the skirt is lined with cotton. The same lace for the skirt overlay is used to make the short matching jacket. The sheath style came on the heels of Dior's new look of the 1950s. It had a similar fitted bodice of the new look style, but replaced the wide skirts with a shorter, more fitted option. If you want to see more historic fashions, check out the museum's historic photo collection, available online at portalberni.passperfectonline.com. A search for dress or portrait will get you started. That's all for today. Thanks for watching the Alberni Valley Museum's Museum at Home. My name is Teresa Ludvigson. I'm, I'm from Alberni Valley Hospice Society. And we're at our location at 2579 10th Avenue. And we want to tell you about our new event, Light Up Hospice, which will begin December 1st for the whole month. So we've never had this event before, and this is our answer to the COVID pandemic social distancing requirements. So we will have this every year, and you can come by and enjoy the scenery, or you can participate uh, through purchasing uh, lights or decor in memory of a loved one that you've lost in the past. And uh, we'll make it happen. So we do know that this is, you know, a tough time of year for some people. So we hope to bring some cheer and some light to everybody's life. And please give us a call at 723-4478 if you'd like to get lights or decor uh, for our light up event.